since it is since uh, demand is high in for the book at harry potter pricing uh like lowering the making a price of 20 dollars and selling more quantities can also have a small margin of profit okay but that's what jillian said and i i that that's true if you drop price you'll sell more and hopefully you'll make more but at a lower margin but that's already captured with the elasticity that's embodied in the analysis so we've got that captured so that's not what's going on here well maybe if they sell it but since the demand was so high they realized that it was going to sell out quick but they sold it at a low price then they could say well, the demand was so high to raise it well, not, you, I thought you were going to head the right direction and I mean I could give you a really big hint but I'm hoping one of you can come up with Amazon, Costco, Walmart. It's you, you guys are hung up on that bulk. Bulk of what? Yeah, they sell some bulky crap, but what else? They got lots of other stuff. What do you mean, Lindsay? You got it. That's exactly right. So what we've done up to this point is single product goods. That formula holds for single product companies. Now these chapters, these next three chapters that we're covering this week is going are, are going to get into bundled goods and multi-product firms. So now if we cut the price for Harry Potter, Harry Potter's the latest greatest thing since sliced bread. They're going to come into my store, Walmart, and fill up their shopping cart when they come for the book, right? In theory, they're going to buy some other things. And so that's really the catch for something like that is following this um, what's sometimes called a lost leader uh, strategy, a lost leader strategy. So the Harry Potter books are going to uh, lead people into the store and then hopefully get some other items along the way. So here's what happened with Amazon. We had some new customers, some additional purchases. And so here's what Amazon did. This last bullet estimates 1% of its 2.89 billion second quarter revenue was due to the added sales from customers who also purchased the Deathly Hollows. So in addition to that, they added that on and they otherwise wouldn't have. So now we're kind of starting to think differently about how we can maximize profits when we have multiple products. Okay. Um, so the bottom line is we're going to think about all of our product line and maybe try to push people into other things. So if I can get them in the door for the Harry Potter book, and maybe I have some fatter margins on other products that complement the Harry Potter book, right? That the, and that's where this Deathly uh, Hollows uh, might follow right in line with that. Okay, so suppose we've got a video store um, that purchases its rival video store. So we got two stores, one, they were competing with each other, but now they're going to purchase the other one. Would you change the price of video rentals at each store? So suppose we're, uh, you know, maybe it's a smaller town like Ottawa. We have a rival store. Would you change the price of video rentals at each store? Uh, no. We no, why? I can give you an example, like in Honda uh, has Acura also a company, but uh, Acura's price is a bit high than the Honda normal vehicles, the uh, economic vehicles. So I have not changed the name of the, uh, what you say, the brand, the Acura to Honda when they purchased it, but they're keeping the name as Acura itself, but it's owned by, it's, but it's owned by Honda. So the prices also has not changed because they have kept Acura as a top variant, uh, uh, vehicles and uh, Honda's economic vehicle uh, economic vehicles has Honda brand name mm -hmm. so okay. so changing uh, so 
having a, another like for this oh, example hold on. let me let me stop you there for a sec so in that context what are some other external forces and somebody else jump in besides who was that Rashan yeah somebody else other than Rashan what are some other external forces that Honda Acura is dealing with um, when they acquire the Acura line a brand loyalty that might be part of it Different types of customer, okay. What else? Cost incurred on the product, manufacturing of the product. Okay, so cost with the product, although they might be taking over what was there, so the cost might not be too much different if they're trying to maintain the integrity of the line and keep it at the same level. Frame it like prime class branding. Yep, and branding, yes. Prime so class branding. Let me, come, let me bring that back and contrast it to this video store. So now we're in Ottawa, Kansas and there's two video stores and one buys the other. Jack the prices up. Jack the prices up. So how is that different than the Acura Honda example? Uh -huh. What they did was combine the shop to jack the price of two bucks on every single thing. Ah, good. They got the exact same customers. Whoever went to that right. location went to this one and they were still willing to pay more. Right. Because now technically they got it from there. Wow, that's excellent. So that's a real world example of exactly what we're talking about mm -hmm. here, right? So the difference between the Acura Honda and that is that they still had substitutes with the Acura Honda thing. We had Lexus for Acura. We've got the other high-end cars that would be able to compete. And the picture we're trying to paint here is that uh, people don't have much of a choice, right? So you're essentially creating kind of a monopoly situation, or maybe that's too strong of a word, but just more market power by acquiring the other store. All right, so reducing price at one store steals one from the other, as we know, so raise prices at both stores, right? It makes sense to raise those prices and bundle that stuff together. All right, so I have what I call chalk talk here. I don't really have a chalkboard anymore, but uh, whiteboard, but I think chalk talk just kind of fun. I can't really couldn't come up with something with whiteboard talk or something like that, uh, or dry erase talk. So um, demand for a bundle of substitutes is less elastic than the demand for individual products. Less elastic demand implies a higher optimal price. What the heck does that mean? So first of all, less elastic, steeper or flatter demand curves? Less elastic. Steeper or flatter? Less elastic. Uh, flatter. Where are we starting? Have fun. So steeper or flatter? As it starts to become steeper, it starts to look like a I for inelastic, which is less elastic or more elastic? Less elastic, right? So less elastic means that it's steeper demand curve, which allows you more pricing power. So one of the things that determines the uh, slope of the demand curve, if you will, or the elasticity of the demand, to be more specific, one of the things that determines that is the availability of substitutes. And so in fact, uh, I like Brianna's example here. If we think about the nail prices, what were they running? Um, where a bill was 25, now it's 27. Okay. So if one company was at, if they were at 25, doing 100 nails a month or whatever, um, if they would try to raise their price to 27, they lost a whole bunch of business. There was, a, there was some customers that stuck around, but they lost 40 units. I had 40 nail settings or whatever. Uh, so demand was pretty uh, elastic because they would just run across the street two miles down the road to the other nail shop, right? So if we eliminate that possibility, in 
terms of they can run wherever they want, but they're gonna, uh, we're gonna both raise the price together, then the demand curve becomes steeper. And so, yes, we're gonna lose some people. Some people will say, screw it, I'm gonna go to Lawrence, right? They're gonna leave Ottawa. But that effect is gonna be a lot less. And so maybe we only lose 10 people now that we, both companies raised their prices $27. So, well, and it, because they're not both companies anymore. And by the way, if they, if they choose to do that on their own, what happens? If they, one company says to the other company, hey, you know, it'd be really beneficial if we just charge $27 each, you know, this whole competition thing's kind of, kind of hurting us. And then they say, okay, I'll do 27 if you do 27. Okay, inky swear, spit shake, and they do it. What's up with that? Okay, possibly. There's another problem looming, though. Uh, possibly, yeah. How much? But they did the pinky swear spit shake, and they know that it's both better for other. Isn't that questionable? Yes, it is questionable legally. That, that's the part I wanted to get. They might be going to jail. Could be a problem. That they won't get to do nails because it's illegal to do that. That's called price fixing. So two companies can't price fix like that. But there's absolutely no problem with the companies merging or one buying the other, whatever. As long as they have co-ownership, of course, now they can do that. But co-ownership is a little more sticky, right? If they actually say, oh, I know we can't price fix, but if we just you know, kind of do this deal together and we'll merge our companies together, then we can do it. And they're like, okay, great. But what happens when I hate your guts because you want to do some advertising that I don't want to do, right? You lose that autonomy. So, so it's a big deal if, if you end up doing that. But the, this is the reality of that, is that by eliminating competition, you make the demand curve more inelastic. So if you're selling cocaine like we talked about last week or the week before, um, how, does the, how do the drug dealers eliminate competition? They shoot them, yeah. AR-15, well, it's actually semi-automatic, right? So we cut off limbs, we kill family members, whatever. But, but it's the, the economics is the same for cocaine as it is for nails and for video stores, right? The economics is the same that we are looking to increase some power, some market power to make the demand curve more inelastic so that we have uh, more control over our pricing. Or so more flexibility. Yeah, that is fine. As, as long as it's not collusive. Yeah, as long as there wasn't a, a meeting at the coffee shop before the bar night started and, and an agreement to, to fix prices. So that, that's just good old fashioned competition. Uh, O-Town was less than you guys, you chose to reduce it, right? That's exactly the outcome we want in a competitive marketplace is that one company doesn't have too much power. They, they compete with each other, and so whatever price of that, that drink ends up being ends up being a good price for the economy. And in fact, we uh, to kind of bring this a step further to tie it into what we did last week, um, we get them fighting it, it out so that they're only earning a normal profit. Economic profits are zero. If the bar owners are earning economic profits, we've got the profit signal going out, and before you know it, somebody starts a new bar up on Main Street, right? Because there's so much money to be made in the, in the bar business in Ottawa. As that new bar opens up, they start undercutting prices, prices start to fall. So market prices of drinks start to fall down and we get back to earning a normal profit again. That's the beauty of the market system. That's, this, that's how, what's so awesome about the pricing system and, and why we don't want to restrict prices. We don't want the government to come in and say, those prices are too high, let's keep them lower. Because those prices are just reflecting values. They're reflecting the value system of the consumers and the producers. They are reflecting knowledge. That knowledge is that there's, there's excess demand in that market. The bar business is a good business to get into. I get into business, prices start to fall. 
price has fallen enough. Nobody else wants to get into the bar business. Now they want to or open up a pizza shop, right? Because pizza prices have been doing this lately. Bar prices are down, pizza prices are up. That whole menu of prices out there reflects an amazing amount of information in the world, reflecting our values of our choices. All stuff that's basically hidden in general. I don't know what Kevin's value is for pizza and beer or Nate's or Jillian's, right? But I can observe their behavior and how they react to price changes. And their behavior as a group tends to drive those prices in different directions. Higher prices mean people value it more. And there might be opportunities if, those, uh, if there's excess profits being made in that industry that there'll be more competition come in and those prices will start to fall. It all starts to work in harmony and it's just kind of awesome, the, the market system. And so you, you, to appreciate that and learn it is something that's so important in my humble opinion. Okay, any other questions or comments there? Kansas City, thumbs up. Good. Okay. So let's see here. Okay, so one of the suggestions um, could be to reposition your products. And this might be for cost purposes, possibly. Uh, and to just kind of change things up for the for the consumers um, so that we're not cannibalizing on on certain areas so um, we can specialize so we got multiple copies of the most popular videos maybe a one a wider range of titles just curious Brianna since you brought it up with the nails do both salons do the exact same services okay so they're both offering the same type of thing you know I, I was trying to imagine if if um, possibly over time, they'd start to do acrylics at one place and. Uh, okay, so they own them too. So you can go for either one. And nails tends to be, you know, the person who's doing them has the skill and the expertise. It's not really a product, it's, it's combined with the service. <laughs> yeah, there are better, better ones than, than others. So. Um, all right, uh, so compliments. So substitutes, Coke and Pepsi, compliments, peanut butter and jelly, right? Good set go together. So what if the video store purchased, purchases the parking lot next door? So common ownership means pricing decisions must consider the effects of movie rentals as well as parking lot use. Reducing the price at one increases the demand at the other. So let's go back to peanut butter and jelly for a second. If there's an increase in the price of peanut butter, what happens to my demand for jelly? Down. That one, this one sometimes is a little counterintuitive. So I always eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches together. If I increase the price of peanut butter, then that means the price of a sandwich is gonna be higher. I'm gonna buy less peanut butter, law of demand, but I'm also gonna buy less jelly because I use it with it. Right? Yes. Right. So kind of go, they go in opposite directions. So just the opposite is true too. So we can reduce the price at one to increase the sales of the other. So imagine if we've got jelly, peanut butter and jelly, and um, the margins on jelly are really high. So imagine that the profit margin, the contribution margins, like we talked about before, are really high on jelly. Which one do I want to decrease? The peanut butter or the jelly or both, if I'm thinking about this, this strategy? Decrease the price on the peanut butter. Good. So if I decrease the price of peanut butter, I'm going to drive more sales to my business for one thing, right? So decreasing the price of peanut butter is going to hurt me a little bit on the margins, but the margins were kind of low anyway. But at the same time, if I increase a bunch of business and people come in and they always buy jelly together with the peanut butter and my margins are really fat on jelly, that might be a profitable thing to do, right? 
So we're going to think about steering people into different products when we have both of them. So on, on this particular issue, I, uh, when I first started teaching this class, I emailed the author of the book because the book says to lower both. And so I, I kind of went through what I just did with you, that wouldn't it make sense to lower, uh, decrease the price of the lower margin good? And he agreed. And he said maybe he'll change that in some future editions. But he, he said, ah, that makes sense. So I talked to Luke Fro on the phone about that one. What was his rationality behind the lower Um, I, I think it was from uh, the substitutes was to raise both. And so, oh, if they're complements, we would just lower both. But it kind of brings in a little uh, extra level of detail when you start thinking about the, the margins. All right. And, and it's probably kind of a loaded question, too. There might be a little bit of wiggle room on both. But the concept would be to lower uh, the lower margin one. Cruise ships, hotels, stadiums, commercial parking lots. What do they have in common? Cruise ships. I was just down in Louisiana and saw some enormous cruise ships that were coming through the port. Go ahead. Did I hear somebody online? Customer flow. There, I, hold on. <laughs> Say that again. Customer service. The commercial service? Customer service. Customer service, good. Okay, customer service associated with them. I'm sorry, Brianna, what were you? The bundle thing, like the food, the hotel, you know, drinks, the okay. luxury things, the parties and clubs, those type of things. Yeah, they which kind of goes along with what uh, they said um, in Kansas City, that uh, customer service kind of goes along with them. So it's kind of a bundled good. Okay, you good? The thing they have in common is the concept of spoilage. Spoilage. And an empty seat, an empty room. An empty parking spot makes you no money whatsoever. Or okay. There are so all those huge ships places. And planes, a lot of times they'll drop those prices at the very end before it's about to leave to try and get as much as they can out of it. Okay. Now, what, is, what example did you just say? I didn't hear you. Did you say plane? Cruise ships and planes. Cruise ships and planes. Yeah. Now, actually, planes don't do that. You, no. you think that they would. So I'm with you there. They used to. Yeah, they used but, to. Right now, they don't. In fact, they tend to raise the price if you're within five days of flying, especially five, but even up to 14, they start to go up. But, uh, 21 days, I heard on Oberlin three years ago, was the optimal time to buy. Uh, yeah, and, and purchase on Wednesday, I heard. Is, now, that might have changed over time. Now, it's six weeks in advance and purchase it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. Is that right? Is that the optimal? I just saw that. Okay. I was going to say, I go about three weeks all the time, so and, and I've had pretty good luck with that, but it certainly could have changed over time. All right, so, but you bring up a good point, and well, I guess since I brought up the airlines, why wouldn't airlines want to do what you said? If they cut prices dramatically to fill those last seats, what longer-term problem might they be having? Everyone, Everyone just waits, yeah. So that's why they don't do it. That's one of the reasons they don't do it. Um, another reason is to price discriminate, which is part of what I think the next chapter is about. Um, who tends to need those last seats on the plane within a week's time? Business travelers. Business travelers. Are they willing to pay more or less? Are they frugal with that or they not? They they if they've got a $50,000 deal that they're doing in New York City, do they care that the that the flight is 800 bucks instead of 400 bucks? No, they didn't need the flexibility. They didn't want to commit to it. So that gets into a, a indirect price discrimination scheme, which is something we're going to talk about later. But this was as good a time as any since we're talking about it tonight to bring it up. That that's one way to identify people with higher values, higher willingness to pay, and it was with the timing in that particular case. And so there's kind of two things going on. One, we don't want to encourage regular customers to put off their purchase until the very end, because that would be the incentive. And then the other is we have these higher willingness to pay people, the business people that are willing to do it. 
Okay, so yeah, we have this capacity issue is one thing. Cruise ships, hotels, stadiums, commercial parking lots. As Kevin said, if, they, if they're sitting empty, it's doing nothing for us. So the marginal cost, perhaps, of putting somebody into that last room or that last seat is actually pretty low. I mean, if we talk about a stadium that holds 14,000 people, if we're at 13,500, what's the marginal cost of putting another 100 people in those chairs? Do I have to hire more security? No. Third, so remember what I said, a 14,000 seat stadium, we have 13,500 booked seats, and I'm thinking about the marginal cost of putting in an extra 100, the last 100, I'm not trying to fill the whole stadium, but an extra 100 people. Do I, gotta have, to, do I have to hire more security guards? No. Do I have to hire more people to run the concession stand? No. Do I have to spend more on electricity? No. Do I have to spend more on air conditioning? Do I have to, there's almost nothing, is there, right? There's almost zero cost of putting those people into the building. So that is, uh, that is different than in cases where there's high variable costs, um, then we might uh, not have that. So with these capacity cruise ships, hotels, stadiums, they all kind of face that, that issue. And so how do we handle that? Um, so with a capacity constraint, we go through kind of a two-step process. When I build the place, how many rooms do I build? When I, when I create the cruise ship, how many rooms do I put in? When I create the parking lot or the parking garage, do I do 400 spaces or do I do 150 spaces, right? So what is the proper amount to do? Um, the costs are mostly going to be fixed or sunk, right? Cruise ships, hotels, stadiums, big dollars. Um, I'm kind of excited. I'm, a, I'm originally from Minnesota, and so I'm still a disgruntled Viking fan after all these years. Um, and so I'm kind of excited about the new stadium up in Minnesota. And I, I think that thing was just short of a billion dollars. One billion. You guys realize there's a thousand million in one billion. So I think it was 997 million. So it's almost a billion dollars uh, for that for that stadium. And so once it's built, it's built. You know, depending on how many events go in there. So you know, how many seats? How big is it going to be? That's what uh, that's what we're thinking about on this long run to recapture it. So we go through this exact same. Uh, optimization process, long run marginal revenue, long run marginal cost. So we're trying to think, okay, over the next 20 to 30 years, the useful life, which is shrinking, by the way, I was kind of surprised that the uh, Texas Rangers stadium, they're thinking about tearing down and building a new one already. And I guess I'm making myself kind of old, but I went, I just happened to be in Dallas uh, for the basketball tournament in 1995, and we toured that stadium when it was brand new. So, in 19, and now here we are, 1995. What are we talking? 2005, 15, 16 years. All right. 21 years. All right, 21 years, and the new stadium is already. They're talking about demolishing it, starting from scratch. I mean, it's a, it's a. <laughs> I can't imagine it's in that rough a shape, but that's the thought process. So when we look at the long run marginal revenue, marginal cost, how many events, what are these capacity, who's going to play there, is there going to be concerts, right? All the revenue generated. And then, of course, all the long run marginal cost. In the long run, um, what kind of fixed costs and variable costs do we have? Loaded question, so I was trying to be careful how I worded it. In the long run. In the long run. All fixed costs become variable. Okay, good. So there are no fixed costs, right? Everything's a variable cost. In other words, the size of the stadium, there's no fixed cost. We're talking about a long enough time horizon that I can choose every single factor of production. 
every single input that goes into building that stadium, I get, I get the opportunity to choose, right? So there is no fixed cost. All costs in the long run are variable. So is there like a time frame on that? Uh, the useful life. So, so, but like that stadium, for example, they say it's 21 years. I think a stadium could last until it's no understanding, like mile high. Like yeah, I mean, over. that's what they're going to do is they're going to, you know, so, think how long that should be, whatever so it is. So at what point do those costs become no longer fixed costs? Like, is there a grace period for stadiums or something well, like that? Like, No, at, at the time of building it, are we going to build a 14,000 seat stadium or a 15,000 seat stadium or a 16,000 seat stadium? So we're going to say, doing our analysis, how long do we think it's going to last? You know, what's the useful life of the stadium? Is it 20, 30, 40 years or whatever? So it's just based on that. It's just based on that. Yeah. On what, what your, what your estimate is. And then same thing with revenues. If we, uh, are people going to pay as much for the new stadium, you know, when it becomes old 30 years from now, so that would somehow be embodied in your revenue calculation. But more importantly, when you start to get 30 years out, what's the present value of that money? If I have a $100,000, what is the present value of $100,000 30 years out? No, it, it's very predictable. It's very predictable. Very much. Not very much. I don't know. Or no, like, actually, 30 yeah. years out. If we're talking about $100,000 now or $100,000 then. All right, here we go. So how do we calculate that? $100,000 30 years from now. What's it worth? Hundred grand. 30 years from now. What are some things that you need? This is review, by the way, of uh, things that will be on your next quiz. We need the interest rate. We need the interest rate. What, how do we calculate that? What interest rate is appropriate for an economic analysis? Not the going rate. Say that again. Kansas City? Uh, not yet. What's the appropriate interest rate? 10%. Is 10% the appropriate interest rate? Answer no, but maybe it could be. Uh, so I, I'm just saying that, that's not a good enough answer. It could maybe be 10% under what circumstances? Hundred thousand dollars thirty years from now. What's it worth today? Present interest rate. Ah, so where are you going to get the interest rate? Um, you going to Google it and do? Nope. Know what it is? We're not going to Google it. Well, what, how am I supposed to know what it is? Uh, like, if I'm supposed to walk over to the bank and that's what, how much it's going to be a loan? How do well, you guess? Like when you deposit so much. So present value much. equals. Future value okay. over. I like this. Jillian's pulling out the formula. Over. Uh, one. One plus. The interest rate. Yeah. Raised to the K. The K or T or N or what is it in this case? The one under the one. Years. Ten years to seven times seven. But now, what's the Hundred thousand. Is that the present value or the future value? Future value. Future value. The future value. So now we're down to the magic question here that I'm trying to tease out of you. That I have. I'm, I'm actually kind of disappointed that none of you have said the right answer. What is the interest rate that's appropriate to use? No. Nope. That thirty is just on length of time. It's probably in those notes somewhere, maybe. No, I'm going to... Is it 1.06? Nope. 72? Nope. Um, you guys are being way too linear in your thinking. Be creative. Yeah. You're thinking about valuing money. How much is it worth to you? How much is it worth to you? How much is it worth to you? How much is it worth to Costco? How much is it worth to Amazon? How much is it worth to Goldman Sachs? What is the freaking answer to that? 
Okay, so Nate, what? What? Work with me. Whatever you value it. Value what at? So you're touching on the right thing. It could be different for different people, right? And what's going to make it the right rate for you? Sam and Samantha. Where's Sam tonight? Yes, if you can get a bigger return, right? Remember when we went through the Sam and Samantha deal with one had 10%, one had 15%? It depends on what you could do with that money, right? It's very specific. That's what makes this economics class not accounting class. Not finance class either. Finance class might have something that you insert the market rate or something like that. This is very personal to you. And that's how it's going to be. Or your company. Yes, it's called the discount rate. So you're going to be discounting that money. If you're investing in the stadium, it's kind of similar to those examples we went through. You know, what else could you be doing with your money? You know, I could be doing this or I could be doing that. The discount rate is special to you. So, is this the net present value rule? Uh, it's the present value rule. The net present value uh, would be one step further from this, which we can, which so we can talk about. I have in our notes from chapter 5, okay. discount rate for present value of money. If my discount rate is 10%. Right, so if... So do you just come up with 10%? Just read, that, read that word again, real if carefully, real slow. If my, discount if my discount rate is 10%, okay. that's mine personally. I own it. So that's what my come up right? with at 10%? Yes. Like so it's what you come up with. It's what you're doing with your company or your money. Somebody might have a discount rate of 2%. An <laughs> old grandma uh, that's got their money safely tucked away in, in some money market mutual fund, it might be 2%. It might be 1.5%. Right? But if you're Goldman Sachs and you're out wheeling and dealing deals, if it's 20%, your discount rate, the appropriate rate for you to insert there. Now, watch how important that is with this. So let's do two of them. Let's do grandma. Here's the grandma one. Hundred. Let me, uh, well, I was going to actually use that calculator up there. So let's do grandma at uh, 2%. And let's do Goldman Sachs at 20%. And let's see what the difference so is. So in a quiz, you're going to give us that interest rate though, right? Usually. Or unless, it's a short like, answer, unless it's a short answer problem, then I'd want you so, to answer just like what I just gave you. So I'd say $100,000 is a lot to me. It's worth <laughs> You have to justify your answer, yeah. And Kevin could say his is worth 10%? Right. I present you. If he justified why. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure I'm getting that because I'm... That's exactly right. Oh, yeah. All right, so that ended up being 237. So 100,000 divided by 237.37. So let's call it, let's just call it 237. So 100,000, 100,000. Uh, the reason I really want to hammer this is this is really critical. 100,000 divided by 237 equals $421. That's 100,000. If you're Goldman Sachs, $100,000 30 years from now is worth how much today? $421. In other words, that's a fair trade. If you were Goldman Sachs, you would just be indifferent. Like, ah, 100,000, 30 years, or 421 bucks today? That's a coin flip. I'll probably take the 421 bucks today. That's the power of that. Now, let's go to grandma for a second here. Grandma, we don't want to forget granny. 1.02 raised to the 30 hour. Both 1.8. 100,000 divided by 1.8. 
100,000 divided by 1.8 equals alternative is a 2% interest rate, the decision for grandma is 100,030 years from now or $55,555 today to make her equally well off. Huge difference, right? All right, so um, that's the type of thing. I, I, the reason I got sidetracked, I think that was a good review of present value, but the reason I got sidetracked on that a little bit was um, once we get these big projects, hotels, stadiums, things that are going to last 30 years, the money that's 30 years out or 40, if it ends up being 40 years out instead of 30 years out, it's not that big of money, the present value, because they're, they're in that bigger discount rate range, right? So they're going to be a lot closer to that bigger discount range. And so 30 years, 40 years, who cares? We're going to be down to peanuts, basically, when we start analyzing it. Okay. But nonetheless, that's important. So when I've uh, built some buildings, um, we have marginal revenue, marginal cost considerations running 30 years out on our projections. So we'd have spreadsheets that captured year by year by year by year estimates of what we thought was going to happen in order to give a fair calculation of the uh, investment today. Okay, questions or comments there? Now, the two-step process becomes kind of interesting when we get to the second step. So now, we spent all that time building the 14,000-seat stadium for the 646-room cruise ship or the 527 parking spot parking lot. We did all that work, and now the money's spent. The economics have changed completely. We have to forget about that money we just spent. We literally have to basically forget about it because it's irrelevant. Now the rent payment, as was on a couple of our, uh, a couple of our quiz questions, the rent, the rent payment becomes irrelevant if we pay cash for that stadium or whatever, um, or if we have a loan on that stadium, or if we have a lease on that stadium. Uh, by the way, it's not unusual to have a 30 to 50 to sometimes 100 year lease on commercial type buildings. So long term lease, those things are gone. And I have to just deal with reality today. And reality today now only deals with variable costs. So I got one secret that I learned that's maybe not so much a secret, but it sure seemed like a secret to me when I was trying to make, make millions. Um, when the economy comes into a crisis mode and there's a shortfall, the older buildings or the people that have chosen to keep a large cash position in their property are in a lot better position to ride out the storm, right? Because at the margin, they don't have that bank payment. They didn't, they didn't take on that debt, right? So they own their property closer to in full, so they don't have that fixed payment, that fixed obligation every month. And so when the market goes to crap, and rent prices fall, those owners that are in are sitting fat in a cash position, in an equity position, so if they own a million dollar apartment building and they only owe 500,000 on it, they're in a lot better position than the person who owns a million dollar apartment building and has $800,000 worth of a loan. When vacancies happen and rent prices fall, they can ride that out because they don't have the big mortgage payment coming out, right? If they're sitting with 10 to 20% vacancy, they can ride it out a little bit longer. So 
when you start to do cruise ships, hotels, and stadiums in your guys' future lives after you get your MBA and you're doing that, remember that you might want to stick in a fatter cash position. Find more equity partners. It might be safer for you to find investors rather than to find bankers. The banker might be willing to lend you 800000 on the million dollar property, but you might also be able to find some outside investors that will be your partners so that you only have to get a $500,000 loan on the million dollar deal. You follow what I mean? Yeah. Then when the crap hits the fan, the investors don't get paid. Banker, Mr. Banker still wants to be paid, otherwise they take the property back. But the investors, you're in a better equity position to ride out a downturn. Okay, any questions, last questions or comments there? All right, so let's do a, a little problem. Suppose that the elasticity is 1.66. The optimal size is estimated to be 300 rooms. So they've already done that for us, right? They've already did kind of a long run marginal benefit, marginal cost. At the optimal size, the marginal cost of the building, cleaning, heating the room, is about $400 per day. Pre-build expected marginal revenue and marginal cost. Is it heating each room or all 300? Uh, all, three, all 300, yes. Okay. I think as well, cleaning, heating, I can't remember, honestly. We'll get there. <laughs> Short run marginal cost is just $40 per day when the fixed costs are ignored post build. So the 400 was per room per day, but that included the fixed cost. And so here we've got $40 per day when we ignore the fixed costs post build. So what if we screwed up? If demand was overestimated pre-build, what should the rooms be priced at if actual, I think that's a double if actual, if actual, if actual occupancy is 250 rooms at $400. In other words, we're charging 400 bucks and we're only at 250 rooms of our 300 rooms. What should be our new price? I have this as a little hint for you. This is your elasticity of demand formula in the most basic format. Um, the elasticity of demand is the ratio of the percentage changes. And I just simply solved that for the percentage change of price. Percentage change of price is equal to the percentage change of quantity divided by the elasticity. Eight percent. Eight percent, did I hear? Yes? Was that an answer or were you guys just mumbling between yourselves? Just mumbling between us. Okay. So 1% change in price. So we want to cut, cut price 1%. Because we want to cut price, right? So 30%. Yeah, like 
Ten percent. Ten percent. Something's not right. Ignore mine. Something's wrong. Okay. Thirty percent. You got thirty. Almost. Thirty, Kansas City. Yeah. Okay. Another thirty percent. All right. So let's see what we got here. Hello. So if we're using the arc elasticity method where we kind of take the in-between for the denominator, new number minus the old number divided by the old number, but we're going to divide by the average. Percentage change in quantity that we need to have done for quantity, 18, which means we need to decrease price. I should have rounded that up. 11%, about 11, so your 10 is pretty good there. 356 bucks a night. Yeah. So good. Who was my 10? Was that you? Okay. Jillian's on the board. Good. All right. Um, so everybody get any questions on that? Do you get the gist of what we're doing there? So we're using our elasticity to fill that hotel, to get that room up, to get the room up to capacity. If we cut price uh, by 11%, 10 11%, you get 356 bucks, we should get that extra bump of 18%. Okay, so this next piece looks at some psychology with pricing. We talked about biases. So in 2008, that was the financial crisis time frame, some airlines had the great idea of cutting snacks and charging for them. How would that make, how would that make you feel? Some of you might not have really felt that, but pretty ticked off, right? Yeah, so you went to Costa Rica and didn't get fed. Well, I'm flying to India tomorrow is my date, and they better feed me. <laughs> I'm on uh, three hours to Newark, and then I think it's 13 hours or something. I can't even remember. 16 hours. 16 is probably, yeah, to Delhi from New Jersey. So 17 hours maybe, 16, 17 hours. Yeah, 30 minutes to Delhi. Yeah. Yeah. He used to feed you at eight hours. Our flight was eight hours and two minutes. So they were right out there, so they didn't give you the. Yeah. the so you, even though, but now here they're even talking about cutting the, you know, the little peanuts yeah, or whatever that used either. to get. Even if you're right now, it was, uh, most of the airlines don't give you for a short haul flight. Yeah. Like, yeah, they kind of cut it out if it's a if it's cheap if it's a quick little puddle jumper, and of course it depends on the airlines. But back. From a history standpoint, everybody got AB peanuts and soda every plane trip. And so when they first introduced this, people were just outraged. Now, if we look at the uh, effect of that, if you're really ticked off at a particular airline, what might you do the next time you fly? Go with another airline, right? Kind of switch just because of that. Now, in reality, that little two ounce bag of peanuts, <laughs> what does that cost the airline per person? Maybe a dollar. Maybe a dollar at most, uh, right, for the soda and everything. So they're saving a dollar, the executive thought, let's save this dollar on a $300 plane ticket, let's cut that back. So that turned out to kind of backfire on, on them back at, at that time. Um, so I think, Customers have come around now a little bit, um, but the the bias that people have is that you feel loss more than you feel gain. It hurts more. So, um, to kind of give you an idea of, of how this would work with my peanut example is to say, you come onto the airplane not expecting to get anything and all of a sudden I hand you a bag of peanuts. And they've done research like this and they say, oh, well, what do you value those peanuts at? And they're like, oh, you know, I don't know, a buck or two or something, you know, how does that make you feel happiness wise on a scale of one to 10 maybe, you know? Oh, it makes me feel happy. I'm really glad that they gave me the peanuts. <laughs> so instead you get onto the plane and you're expecting the peanuts and the peanuts are there and we take the peanuts away from you or you learn that you're not gonna get them. 
Now, what do you value the peanuts at? Oh, that's like five, that's like 10, 15% of the cost of my flight. You know, you can't take that from me. In other words, the exact same item, whether you're taking it away as a loss, depending on how the problem's framed, or you're giving it to them as a positive, people put different values on that. And so that is, a, is, is an important thing to consider um, when you're making moves at your company that giving away freebies, which we tend to do too, right? Oh, let's give them a little trinket bag or whatever. That has less of an impact than uh, a loss that might be uh, happening if they feel like they've owned it already. Okay. So I happened to be down in New Orleans last week with Katrina. Home Depot did raise prices on generators and water. So if people sense that you're being unfair, that can have uh, some bad consequences, companies have learned. That one guy who was trying to jack up the price of the drug, you remember that? Wasn't that just this last spring or last fall that he, yeah, that was it for HIV, that one was there? Yeah, I think yeah. So. so he raised the price 5,000% or something like that, mm -hmm. bought the company and raised it up. So yeah, that tends to usually not uh, play out very good. These people already have AIDS. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, my bad. <laughs> Not bad enough. All right. So to, un to avoid looking unfair, companies need to be creative. So if the venue starts to raise prices, um, they might be perceived as unfair, that they're hurting the uh, people, but yet there's a, a secondary market that uh, evolves. And so now we've um, kind of evolved into that being accepted a little bit more now with StubHub and part of that is the way artists have had to make money in different ways uh, other than the live music event due to streaming and uh, one hit wonders of being able to put their stuff out on singles. So what uh, I, I don't know if it was Britney Spears or something, I can't remember if it's coming up on my slide, uh, but sometimes artists would hold back tickets and then make money by selling them on the secondary market themselves. So they would go to StubHub, because you can be pretty anonymous with StubHub. So if the artist has 100 tickets reserved as part of the arrangement with the, with the stadium or the event uh, producer, now they can take those 100 tickets and dump them on the StubHub and they're probably pretty good seats and make money that way. That's kind of part of the business arrangement. But if they get busted doing that, um, fans tend to think they're not being very fair. All right, let's take a break. So, side note on your airline thing. Yeah. They also stopped handing out vouchers. For? Delayed flights. Yep. Oh. I flew back from France, Italy, and Greece. I was there for three weeks. Yeah. My flight stopped because I didn't have enough money to pay for the airplane. So, they fixed it before I could get on the plane. Yeah. So, we were back late and they didn't call ahead to Boston and I was like, hey, we need some. People that are on the next flight, they didn't do that. So I have to stay the night, get on a new flight, and then the sensor on the luggage door was broken, and it was broken for so many consecutive flights that they had to get So we were there for 12 hours, and then we had to place the five movies on Boy, usually, I mean, that depends on the company. Um, yeah, like, you know, if, like American Airlines, I don't know. Yeah. Just that company, but, I mean, and they'll have, like, like the right, they'll have different policies on, well, like, weather delays they won't obviously do. But you, a lot of times, mechanical failure or otherwise. So Southwest has been pretty good for me on that. I, I got reimbursed. Well, I was really ticked off. We were at this um, 
in Chicago and it was a weather delay. But they kept telling us that we were going to be able to get on, get on, get on. And one of the uh, luggage guys or somebody made the comment of, well, that flight was never going. And so at, let's say, 5 o'clock, um, I learned this at midnight when we were basically stranded at the airport or close to it. And then the luggage guy said something, well, that flight was never going or something like that. So that's what I complained to him about. I said, hey, I know it's not your problem with you know weather delays or, or whatever. I think it was actually weather in a different city that went, went logged, jammed us up. But he and I could have made, I could have been home by then by just renting a car, you know, instead of waiting the, the seven hours till midnight to learn it. Because uh, it, was, it was only in Chicago, we could have driven home. So they ended up giving me my money back on that flight. So. We flew to, we were going to fly from Kansas City to Phoenix to Seattle. We were going to Alaska last year as a family. And there was some sort of sand rainstorm in Phoenix, so we couldn't fly on and said, we're going to check in 30 minutes and we like this now for the delay is 30 minutes. And then 30 minutes was an hour. And then an hour, it was two hours. And then finally at 11.30, they said, this is the last shuttle to the hotel. We were still in line trying to get tickets to, for another flight. We had to sleep at the airport. But they gave us free breakfast the next morning. Um, and then they gave us first class tickets straight to Vancouver, mm -hmm. which is where we were going. Yeah. Gosh, I hope I don't have flight delays on this in the intro. Because I have a, oh, we have a fairly tight connection tomorrow, but we uh, leave here at 5.10, get into New Jersey with a time change at 9.09, .09, and then our India flight is 9.50. You're going to have to run. But we're at the same terminal. Oh, okay, so, that's good. <laughs> But any that. little delay, and usually they'll hold the flight a little bit for that. It's all with United. But, and then the, I'm coming back when we have another connecting flight. And the problem is that one's internal with a different airline. It's not It's yeah. not a true connecting flight to the other one. So chances of that was our, for something like that is not good. That was our problem. We changed from Air France yeah. to American. Oh, yeah. Then you yeah. try doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I, because of the delay, we literally like we landed and we had 15 minutes to make it to our next terminal. Yeah. But we hadn't technically checked in yet, so they right. sold our tickets. Right. So. Because you weren't on a connection. Right. Yeah, you're giving, you're making me scared. I think I shouldn't have cut that lid. We have it. It's two hours, but I'm, we're going from the middle of India back to Delhi. And then I think it's a two hour before we jump our flight back to home. That's one of the ones we'll get for you about. So. It was when we got home that, like, because we like, landed in Boston and then Air France wasn't going to do anything about our flight. Yeah. And so finally, the, well, I, went with, they're, they're I went with people, the people student ambassadors. So the, the company that we were with, they called and they were like, no, you're going to put them in hotels. So they finally put them in hotels. Huh. They we're not happy about it. Okay, right, I'm gonna go get a water here. I got a lady in Birmingham, Alabama, tell me. Oh, Birmingham. Oh yeah. Tell me that I was just gonna have to borrow one of their wheelchairs for a month no. until they got mine to me. No. Because they lost my wheelchair. Uh, they you it's don't find to, it. Oh yeah. <laughs> And then what they do is they actually like tag the wheelchair just like his luggage. Yeah. It goes with me to the plane. They strap right. me on this thing that looks like I'm about to either do a NASCAR race or get electrocuted. Uh -huh. It has this 85 point harness, and then they put me in the plane. And then uh, uh, if there's your supposed, wheelchair is too wide for the yeah, you know, my wheelchair would never fit through the door for one, and okay. then never fit down the aisle. So they stick me in this thing that's only about this wide. I don't know about you, but my Butt's bigger than that. I mean, alone. let's be honest. Yeah, like my hips at every yeah. single fucking seat. So, so I get in there, and they're supposed to take the chair straight from when I get out of it to the belly of the plane. Mm -hmm. No stops. Do not pass go. Do not tell it two hundred dollars. Go straight to the belly of the plane. My chair was still sitting on the tarmac in Salt Lake City. Oh my! I would be so pissed. And this lady was coming. Well, she's gonna have to wait until we can send it to you. When I was like, I was 16 at the time, and I was flying back and forth to Greece and stuff, and 
like so I call my parents and I was like, Mom, we're stuck in Boston. She's like, So what's that mean? I'm like, well, we're gonna have to sleep in the airport. And she goes, Excuse me. She was pissed. I mean, our leaders did everything that they could. Like there was a like I was so upset and we've been gone for three weeks. It's the first time I've ever been gone for like a really long time. So I'm in the airport, I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> so one girl was like, I'll give you my ticket because she had been on trips like that before. Well, the lady at the terminal was like, you don't have the right name. Like, it, my ID did not match up with my ticket. And she's like, you can't go. She's like, sorry, like, you just can't. And they're like, can we change the name on ticket? Because I really want to just go home. That's all I want to do. I just want to go home. And they're like, no, not, not now. Like, they're getting home deported. So I had to wait. But it was interesting. Yeah. I tried to this lady for that she didn't get my wheelchair to the union the next day that I was going to own a new airplane. I will own it. I will study it. Oh, okay. well, and the thing is, I went to study aviation. And so it's like, look, I know you have another flight coming out here in the next three hours from that terminal. That means you're going to take that wheelchair, you're going to put it on that plane. And this evening, you're going to take those vans that you put everybody's luggage in and you deliver people's lost luggage to them. You're going to put that wheelchair in there and it's going to be to me by tomorrow morning. Or I'm going to own a, a airplane. So, well, I'm going to have to get my manager. Like, you do that. Should have done that 10 minutes ago. <laughs> the people in Alabama just cracked me up, just like with how they like talk. Because they try to be nice, they really do. But like sometimes their like accent just comes off as an attitude, and you're yes. like, do not get an attitude. Yes. I mean, like, and you know, and, 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 I mean, okay, I hesitate to say this. I'm not a racist person, but being black women in the South, they are. <laughs> I have, they, they are awesome because they can. They are like a pendulum. They can go either way. Yeah. I've had one. That you know, just you tell me you don't like catfish, you better sit down, you're gonna try my catfish. You right. know? And I mean, they're just that way. Mm -hmm. And then there's other ones like, other ones like, you don't tell me. <laughs> oh. And my wife's from the South, and she's picked up a lot of that attitude. <laughs> Anyway, I'm kind of blind. I 
My friend. So can I get just new random sticks? I look up on the HD website to find out if it's actually a Like what I see the special. Yeah, I can always go ahead and just put like 16 in there. I don't think it's going to call it 16. That's okay. But yeah, I need to actually oh, research on this and other things. I think it's going to be a good model for that. And I'm going to be a good model for that. And I'm going to be a good model for that. And I'm going to be a good model for that. Yeah, it's like a bunch of guys. Definition: Charging different prices to different people for the same good. Charging different prices to different people for the same good. So, um, give me some examples. Charging different prices to different ladies, people for the same good. Ladies, razors more expensive than men razors. Okay. Now, with the ladies' razors, I mean, I, I just want to pick on it a little bit, but I think you're right. Uh, they're slightly different. They kind of make a pink, a pink, uh, you know, holder than other, but yeah, you know, and whatever. So there might be some other things with, but but you're right. That, that's a pretty good example. The, so the only reason I'm picking on it is that I'd really like it to be the same good for price discrimination, and you're real close. Well, they're very similar goods. There's new pens that fit <laughs> that got <laughs> removed from the market in a week. Russ, what about uh, uh, for the uh, uh, mobile uh, connection like uh, Sprint, for loyal customer, different price, and for the regular customer, different price? OK. So some sort of loyalty discount? Uh-huh. OK, good. Usually when Apple came up with it, if the white phone was more expensive than the black phone. Okay, now that's a different, even though it's just white and black, it's still different. So I really want the good to be identical. It's literally pens. Like pens. pens. Okay, like, so yeah, back to your pens. Literally thing. a package that said pens for her. Yeah. And it just had a different bottom. Oh. And it's for your hands. So I guess 
all of us have been writing incorrectly for and so it, years of schooling. And, and you're saying there's a male version that was it's just, identical except for color. Right, they just had a package that said "fit for her." For her. Okay. And then it got removed from the market in like a week because Ellen came on about it, Oprah did. Basically, okay. She just like freaked out. Okay. And so it was literally the same product, just one was marketed to females. So really it was just the label? Yes. On how it was marketed to them. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Yeah, Brianna? You touched on one example earlier with the airline. Yeah. Basically the gym can for them charging water for the person who yes. you know, is trying to take it versus those early. Right, and some of those people might have bought it even at the same time, but they brought it from a different site or something. Now, the way the market's kind of gravitated now, most of all, if you guys have searched, all those sites basically have the same prices. I mean, almost similar for, for a lot of those, people, but especially for airlines. Um, as somebody who has driven coast to coast multiple times, gasoline. Gasoline. Now, it's the exact same company. Now, you can go to the exact same gas station, okay? And depending on the area that it's in, depending on the uh, wealth of an area, like my wife's from Alpharetta, Georgia. Okay, so let me let me just cut you short because in order for this to be price discrimination, I need different people going to that exact same store at that same location, paying different prices for different people. To to be in form, because otherwise we get into other market factors. Uh, two. What about filing taxes? What about it? Going to the tax accountants and they charge different prices for different people? Uh, that, that's possible. The, the tax accountant might be doing that a little, to some degree, yeah, because they, they probably have a little power to, well, what's your fee? And they kind of maybe saw some of your W-2s and you're making 100000 a year versus somebody who's making $40,000 a year. It's possible that... The deductions, you know, both had a home, one had a $400,000 home with a lot more interest to deduct than the one who had a $100,000 home with a smaller amount of interest, but the actual typing on the keyboard to input the interest expense was probably the same for both. And so I don't think a lot of, a, do you know this from personal experience too? Okay. No, just, I, I think it's possible. Yeah, I guess Kevin, you brought that up before that. So I, I think that's a possibility that there's there okay. price discrimination there. Um, their their fear would be some clients finding out what the other ones do, but if that's fairly limited, then we might see that. Okay, yeah. Or I can think of another example. Oh, go ahead. Um, what about automotive going to a mechanic shop that can charge a woman more than a man? Absolutely, yeah. That's that's been a heavy one was with auto mechanics and then also buying a car is another one since you brought up cars. So purchasing a car, you know, if the sticker price says $24,500, is that what everybody pays or is that what it, you know, for that same good, same model, if it's brand new car, that might depend on your negotiating skills. So, and then, but definitely getting your car fixed is that they've had that type of thing. Brandy, had no? Uh, so say that again on the front. So if you visit, say I was, I wanted to buy something from Sears, and yeah. I kept going to the exact same site looking at oh. the same thing, that eventually they start to bump the price up because they know what eventually I'll buy. I think they have dabbled with that type of thing, yes. Yes, I think I think they have. And actually, uh, Sam and Caleb, come up to these seats. That was the back room. I want to see your faces a little closer. Or you can sit here anywhere in this row. Anywhere in this row. Because then you're closer to the microphone for everybody too. I made the, the Kansas City people move up too. Uh, as you asked the sector, I have an experience. I have been experienced like a year ago. Okay. Uh, it's like a restaurant, a pizza restaurant, uh, back in Europe, uh, where uh, they make sections for different kinds of customers, which we discussed in our homework also, like three weeks back, and the first week or second week of the thing, like yeah. uh, offering a bars and everything. 
uh, where the people they they offer different kinds of environments for different kinds of different class people like the people who come down for a regular uh, uh, regular lunch or a meal they yeah. have a tent section where the prices will be cheaper and for the delegates or meetings they have a back end and for the people who want to enjoy with the family they have a different sections and the prices also changes according to the requirement okay so if the if the sections are identical in terms of the appeal of the room like how nice the room is yeah uh, then i would say you've got something but if the if the one room is nicer because it's got aquariums and beautiful carpet and whatever if, then we're talking we're back to a bundled good and and the actual good is different right so they're not identical goods so they're paying more but they're getting more too so that's what i'm trying to avoid avoid with that okay, so keep Go ahead. One more quick. Yeah. On Thursdays, if you go to this Walmart, the bananas are like 19 cents only if you ask them <laughs> for it. If you don't ask them, they just price you at 55 cents. So yes. Yes. That that is yes. That that's a different type. Now that's having that's a kind of an indirect form of price discrimination. <laughs> but yes, the bananas on Thursday. If you guys don't know, everybody knows about the banana deal. Oh, you yeah. know people. Okay. So. Yeah. 19 cent bananas, but you have to tell them because it's a price match of, I even forget, they're, they're usually so good about doing it now. What was it, uh, the safe, uh, what are they actually matching? What, which Isn't it safe like No, it's no. not Aldi's. Which one? Dylan's. No, it's not Dylan's. Yeah. It's Aldi. No, I don't think it's Aldi's either. No. I was hoping it's it's that cheap there. place no, on the, the yellow one in Lawrence that, anyway. You have to, you're supposed to name that place, but Russ, I forgot it. Russ, how about motels? I think it was checkers. Russ, yeah. yes. How about motels? Like when we go at the peak time, the charge is high for the same room? Uh, if it's a higher room in a hotel, that's a different good. So what I would want is... No, for the same room, like the, on different times, the, the price changes uh, based upon different, kind of, different time. Okay. So if it's if it's a Wednesday yeah. versus a Saturday, those are different goods too because the t the timing of the events. So the, the, that's still a little bit different. So I want in its purest form, it's the, it's the same good. All right. So here's the three keys to successful price discrimination. You need buyers that are different. So specifically, differing elasticities. So different willingnesses to pay. So. If we have the, the student discount at uh, Peach Wave, right? So in order to get the student discount, students in general have lower incomes than non-students, right? And so income will affect the demand curve and affect the elasticity. So people with higher incomes might have a less elastic demand, a steeper demand curve. And so they can charge higher prices to those people. So the peach wave for the same yogurt, if you're a student, you get one price. If you're a non-student, you pay a higher price, right? So you also have to be able to legally separate groups of buyers. Students are not a protected class in the United States, believe it or not. And just because you're a student doesn't get you special uh, circumstances. Uh, race, Religion, the other protected classes are off limits. So you can have whites only, 20% off, uh, blacks, Mexicans, come on in for your special today, right? That will land you in jail, as you can probably imagine. There'll be some sort of YouTube video uh, streaming on you. So, so you need to be able to legally, legally separate groups of buyers. And that can be difficult. So that's what makes it kind of a tricky thing to do. How did we separate the business travelers from the regular consumers with the airline example I just went over earlier? It's a need. Their attire? You might be able to get away with that, maybe. But what was it about business travelers? What was it? They're making more money. They're making more money, yeah. But how did we separate? Is it, first of all, is it possible for a business traveler to book a flight uh, 21 days to a month out. Sure it is, happens all the time. You know, that's how I, I just booked a flight today actually for a conference I'm going to do Atlanta uh, in October. So yes, that happens. Now, when I booked that, did I pay the same price as somebody going to Atlanta for a vacation? 
yeah, we just both went to Southwest and did it. So, so how can I separate out those buyers through the timing of the purchase, right? We just got done saying that business travelers will tend to want to book uh, their flights on short notice. And so those ticket prices escalate very fast if you get within five days or maybe even 10 to 14, depending on the company, those prices will start to ramp up. And so what we're naturally doing is catching those last second people. Of course, guess who else gets thrown in there? My mom just died and I need to get to Texas for the funeral. Oh, well, sorry, ticket prices are 800 bucks. Well, that person probably has fairly inelastic demand too, right? I'm getting to Texas no matter what, I don't care what it costs. So they might get caught up and that's where you get into some of the airlines still have bereavement um, uh, discounts if you are going for a funeral. But some, most airlines I think have kind of gotten away from that even. So the tickets are gonna be what, what they're gonna be. All right, and then lastly, the good itself has to be difficult or impossible to resell. Difficult or impossible to resell. So, um, you know, the peach wave yogurt, frozen yogurt, um, is probably pretty difficult to resell once you take it out of there, right? So it's going to be hard for you to run your own business selling discounted yogurt. Woohoo! I got my... 10% student discount or 15% student discount, and now I'm gonna go on to eBay or Craigslist and really sell this thing real quick, right? I got this, I've got the, the super lime with the gummy bears and the sprinkles, and I'm gonna resell this baby at full price on Craigslist when I, when I bring it home. Not gonna happen. But if we're talking about a bottle of booze at the liquor store, right? If you can get a 20% student discount at the liquor store, you might be able to take that bottle of Grey Goose out the door and resell it somewhere, right? So if you're able to do that, if other people are able to do that, the liquor store is quickly losing the reason why they were giving the discount in the first place. They were trying to get additional sales in, but by giving the student the 20% off and then the student calling up Russ, his junkie, Hey, do you got my vodka? Yeah, you got the 10% deal, right? You get 10%, I get 10%? Yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. Now the, the owner just missed out on me going to the liquor store and making the purchase at full price, right? So it's actually a losing proposition if the good can be resold. And so we call that, the fancy word we put on that is arbitrage, is to buy in one market and resell it into another for basically no risk, arbitrage. Buying in one market, selling in another with basically no risk and making kind of some easy money. It's called arbitrage. All right, so that is uh, our keys for discri price discrimination. Um, so if you cannot do some of that, if you can't separate your people very well, um, student IDs work nicely if you're using them, right? So OU has kind of authenticated this person with this identification. Maybe it's a picture ID, and so we got it. Or if you're giving a senior discount at McDonald's for coffee, they can pull out their driver's license and prove that their age. So indirect price discrimination comes about when we can't ID the members of the group. So that would be like our airline example. And so um, we need to um, figure out maybe some clever ways to, to get people uh, the, their products sold. <clears throat> okay, so discriminate by offering two products, higher price, higher quality, lower price, lower quality. We'll talk about that later. Uh, I think one of you just was mentioning this, weren't you? Oh, well, that was, was that you, Roshan, with the, with the restaurant example? The nice room and the not so nice room? Uh, it was Manish. Manish, okay. So that, that would be an example maybe there of doing an indirect pricing uh, method where by putting, you know, spending, spending five extra dollars on nice things, I can charge 20 more dollars for the plate, right? If I'm giving a little bit of differentiation, I can, 
I can get the higher uh, the higher end buyers. All right. So yes. What's that? Previous life sweat. That happens like a lot, like serving, like waiting tables. Like if you like see some people come in, you're like, oh, they're gonna chip me. Like you're gonna hook them up. So yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Because you're gonna get a bigger tip, or vice versa. Yeah. You're like they're not gonna be so I'm gonna charge people for it. <laughs> right. No deal for you. Yeah. All right. So. <laughs> um, Tickets to a movie theater, senior discount, student discount, is that direct or indirect price discrimination? Direct. Direct, direct right? So we can actually separate them. Grocery stores, discount coupons. Indirect. Indirect, right? Because the problem is the rich person can clip coupons too, like me. I like to clip coupons if it's, or use groupons or whatever. So the idea is to make it be a, a big enough wall. Uh, most normal people that uh, maybe don't aren't as, aren't as frugal as I will say, well, I make enough money. I don't have to waste the time. And I'm not a big coupon clipper, by the way, because you, if you guys have tried that, that takes some effort to actually do the work associated with that. But if you're a lower income person and have additional time on your hands, you might find it more beneficial because it's a bigger fraction of your total income than somebody who's making $100,000 a year, right? So it might be a waste of time if I can go do some consulting work for $150 an hour, why am I gonna spend my time coupon clipping, right? So that's the idea with uh, cutting coupons and, and uh, uh, rebates is that we raise the cost and so hopefully we get the intended outcome. All right, we talked about the airlines being indirect. Um, and we talked about different price discrimination. Some of the examples we kicked off with. All right, so give this a read. This is an example over in the Philippines. And cell phones were just getting, getting global. Okay, so we've got a global company, a big company, $120 is pretty much what they've been selling their price around the world for their, for their phone. And they've got this new market where people are, have uh, lower incomes and can't quite uh, kick off the $120 phone. And then this is kind of an interesting little thing with growth. Uh, the firm with the largest share at 10% penetration will grow to 40% without marketing when market penetration grows to 30%. So there's kind of this benefit they've observed over time when you're going into a new market. So there was some advantages to getting in quickly. So if the company just goes into the Philippines and starts cutting prices, <laughs> to try to get to that 10%, what kind of issues might they face? All right, yeah, so it looks like kind of a business opportunity. If the world market's at 120, we can kind of uh, um, resell them otherwise and effectively losing our market share around the world. All right, so, um, here's what the uh, time looked like when they were at from the first digital network. So this is in years and mobile phone penetration, trying to get to that 10-year, uh, 10% mark. And so that's where they were in 1997, not quite there. They decided to reduce the price to 90 bucks. So have you ever wondered why um, 
some companies have the open uh, chip that you can go, like T-Mobile and AT&T, and other ones are locked down. Now, did Verizon start to do the chip now, too? Or are they still locked down that you have to use their phone, right? So you can't switch around phones. So I'm a T-Mobile user, so I bought, actually, I got my, my current phone uh, was from uh, China, uh, the OnePlus One, and it's a global phone that has the chip. So as long as you've got a company that uses the little SIM card, uh, you can get that done. So they're like, aha, we'll create a specialized phone with a SIM lock, and Turkish hackers got it. And so before they do it, 15,000 phones were sold to Western Europe. So you're exactly right, Nate, with some arbitrage going on, which kind of took away the, the reason to do it in the first place. So for them it worked once they plugged the hole with the, with the hackers to get that taken care of, they were able to get their uh, market penetration. So you kind of got to be clever. You, you try not to cannibal. We talked about cannibalizing and alienating your other customers. That's part of the, the battle that you face with, with um, price discrimination. All right. Robinson Patman Act. So let's see, did they put a date down here? I think the Robinson Patman Act goes back to like the 50s when they had large, especially with grocery chains. They were trying to, there was large grocery chain stores that were opening and they didn't want to see the mom and pop businesses be ran out of town. And so they, the politicians, uh, develop this act to help uh, keep too good of deals for volume discounts going on for uh, chain businesses. So the companies might say, well, what we've learned, what was the fancy word that said that if, as we increase the volume, our long-run average costs our long run average total cost might be falling. What was that concept? No, not that one. So average costs fall as I increase the scale of production. Economies of scale, yeah. So once I do the scale in there, I was hoping I might get. So um, when companies would fight a lawsuit that was enacting the Robinson Patent Act, they would say, well, hey, the, this price discount was justified, that we faced lower cost for the company that was buying a whole bunch. It was actually lower cost. So it's not like we were trying to harm anything. That was just um, what we needed to do to, to stay in business. So it became kind of sticky that it's not, not that easy for the government to just kind of roll out some legislation for that. So computers. I think that still goes on today. It does. I think it does. Yeah, I don't know if it's specifically Dell, but that type of thing goes on. Because yeah, a lot of times businesses will just automatically, you know, if you've got an employee and, and maybe it's your executive assistant or something, and you're like, hey, we need to go buy this, go find a deal. And they go to a website, they're like, are you a business or a retail? Oh, well, we're a business. And they just click through, not necessarily clicking through what the customer version would be. And so, in this particular case, they were able to do identical computers. And this is a little bit dated, but what's a variation of that, that
that goes on with computers. I'm sure you guys, a lot of you have shopped computers and uh, computer models. What's some other things that you maybe have seen that might be able to do a little price discrimination with? I was actually just looking at computers and I noticed they have like special categories as gaming computers uh -huh. versus other ones. And I think in some ways you can get a computer with all of that stuff in it. Yeah. In normal computer section. I think you're right. And so what, what they'll be able to do is they'll um, add on a component that by itself might just be a $10 ad, but it's something to at least make it a little bit different, and then they'll charge the big price for it. Right? So the actual component that's being added to it isn't that much of an add-on, but you really couldn't do it yourself very easily either. But it's enough of a differentiator to say, oh, this is a gaming computer and it's got a faster graphics card or whatever. So they're able to kind of move some of those pieces around um, for business quality. So another, anybody else, any comments before I make one more yeah. thing? Yeah. Working with Gail, okay, the reason why they used to do this is because a consumer will pay a full price when he buys a computer versus a large business like, for example, Microsoft is buying hundreds of or thousands of Dell computers. They would not pay in cash. They would take credit for 60 days or 90 days. So to go ahead and uh, recall from the credit that they're going to give us to them, they actually go by adding the value with the price. Yeah, so they could kind of roll in the credit, and that's that's maybe and we're just reading in, which is totally fine to kind of read in more of what's going on here, but kind of like rolling in the financing terms into the price. Right. You know, it might be a strategy that you can do too if if those types of customers tend to. Uh, have a financing or almost like a lease program, you know, rolled into it. So yeah, that's some other ways that we can be clever on, on selling basically the same product for, for higher prices, depending on who, the, who we're targeting. Um, let's see, I had, oh, the other thing that I've noticed, um, they might change the model number slightly. Like this is the 8563B, and this is the 8563C. Correct. And one might be priced higher, but if you actually dig into the nuts and bolts of it, they're they're actually the same same machine. Yep. So they've also changed model numbers to be, well, this is business grade stuff. And sometimes I think there, there's reality to it, or at least a, a little bit of reality. So some of the business grade machines were a little tougher, more durable. If you've got salespeople that are banging them around in hotel rooms and airplanes when they're traveling. So they might have been a little bit higher quality components. So sometimes there are little differences like, like that, but um, not enough differences that compensate for the, the higher price. So it's kind of a mix of, of price discrimination there. Okay. Uh, so this is the schmuck part here. The author likes to uh, bring in the schmuck. Consumers do not like knowing they are paying higher prices than others. You know, how do you feel when you learn that you paid a higher price than somebody else? Kind of like, darn, I should have did my homework. You kind of feel taken. You might have some resentment. Uh, actually, this, this kind of happens to... Uh, one of the students on the trip in Louisiana bought one of those New Orleans masks and she bought it at the first place that we went to and then we went deeper into, oh, kind of near Bourbon Street or something, kind of off the main canal touristy place and it was $5 cheaper and she's like, oh my God, you know, and to a high school student it was 25 versus 20 and then we went to another store and it was $10 cheaper than what she had purchase so she just kind of like kept feeling like a schmuck each time like oh so buyer beware um we start to learn from that what do you do when you see a promotional box on a website okay go to the real website Find a promotional code. Look at promo codes, right? So if there's a promo code 
Go ahead, Kansas City. Do I hear somebody talking? No, we were saying about the promo code itself. Okay. So, yeah, you start Googling, right? I mean, I, if you haven't done that, you should. No, <laughs> the yeah. little sale price thing, all you got to do is if it's like, I don't know, let's say discount tickets to Worlds of Fun, Oceans of Fun or something, and there's like promo code. I'm like, oh, Worlds of Fun, Oceans of Fun, Google it really quick, promo code, and boom, enter this promo code. It was for this week only, and put it right in there. Chrome Honey? Yeah. Is that a, it's a plugin. an app or you add it onto your Chrome? Just type in Honey in the Chrome um, like it's search bar and you click it and then whatever website you're on, just at the top right hand corner before you check out, you click it and it runs all the promo codes that is on the internet for that. Oh, website. it does an auto search. Basically does what I said to do manually. It'll, it'll, it'll go and, and it run them for you. the one that's the best for you. Wow. Okay, honey, I got to yeah. No, I, I'm not doing it right. I'm just taking a note. It automatically looks up for the code for the particular product and keeps it ready. Yeah. The moment you're on the checkout page, yeah, no, I get it. it. I get it. All right, cool. So we kind of learned from that, right? So it's possible that coupon might kind of foil if you're a business by doing your website that way, you might be unraveling your purpose because you don't want to sell all of your products at the 20% discount. You know, we're all taking notes already. Like, we know, like, I'm going to do this. But for the business, that totally screws them. Because the whole purpose is to sell different prices to different people. And so if, they, if, if the consumer can overcome that, then you shouldn't do it. Because the only reason you're doing it in the first place is to get new people to your business, not to just cannibalize on the old. I still want the old, tried and true customers to be paying the regular price, not them getting a discount. Otherwise, you're just essentially dropping your price, correct? Think if of it that think way. About it, if you think about it, though, like, when is the tried and true you know, customer, consumer, when they be looking for those kind of deals? Like, knowing, like, Victoria's Secret, for example, has a deal going on every single week. So the tried right. and true consumer doesn't, buy underwear unless it's 7 for 27 or 10 for 35. Right. Yeah. Now, and that's a little bit different. That's kind of like Kohl's, too. That, that's just their business model, which actually plays on a different human bias than what we're talking about now. Okay. So the bias that they're playing on is that we feel good about getting that discount. And so instead of pricing it at $20, I'm right away going to price it at 30 and give a 10% discount or a whatever, 20% discount, 30% discount, whatever, so that, that, so that it maths out. So I'm going to play that game as a business strategy, which is a little different than price discrimination, where remember this is the consumer surplus, folks, that we've got $20, and so we've got 20 units being sold at $20. So... With, uh, let me stop the share for a second here. Um, we're trying to get the people who are willing to pay more is one way to think about it. If I can separate the students from the non-students, and I can get my markers. If I can find out who's a student and who's a non-student, then let's have these people pay 25 bucks and these people pay 20. And what I've done is I've kind of taken the consumer surplus, right? Remember the consumer surplus was the value that I had above and beyond that? And so now I'm going to have that be profit for my business. The consumer, hopefully doesn't feel like they're being screwed because they're still paying what they were willing to pay. 
And in fact, some consumers were willing to pay $27 and they still feel like they're getting a deal. See what I mean? So it's not like we're screwing them over, but if we bring some of this human bias stuff with behavioral economics into it, and they learn that they're a schmuck, that they could have paid 20 instead of 25, then we might have some lost customers and some hurt feelings. So you gotta be careful with how you, how you set that up. All right, um, and then the other, the other yes. part of, go ahead. Um, I have a small question. Uh, when I just stepped into US, I have been to a JCPenney in which I bought some goods and they gave 10% discount when we uh, go again to that store. So will that be considered as price discrimination or psychological? I mean, um, probably a little more psychological on that one because it was 10% on anything at the store, correct? N next time if we go there and if we show the same, I mean. Oh, next time on the next purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, but is it the next purchase of boots or anything at the store? Anything. Anything yeah. at the store. Probably a little more on the psychological part there to try to get long term, uh, longer term customer. They're trying to keep you that way rather than being. Uh, price discrimination really sticks to the good is, is what we want to think about. And so if we do have 20 units, the other thing with price discrimination is we might have a three-tiered system where if we can sell some units at $15 and not alienate, we might pick up some new customers. So now we picked up uh, 10 more units being sold at $15. Right, so we have this much more revenue added, right? And then hopefully, obviously, we're making money as long as our marginal cost, if the marginal cost per unit is uh, something less than that, then we're still making money on those extra. Okay, so that is some issues with price discrimination. I think that might have any questions come to mind or comments? Additional ones? So, Ras, I have one more question. So, uh -huh. when did you opt for psychological pricing? Uh, say that one more time. When, when what for psychological price? When we will go for it. When the market will choose to go with psychological pricing. Or the company will, I mean, well, okay, so if, they, if the company gets too generous with their discounts, then they'll go out of business, right? So if they, if they start to get too aggressive with that, they'll find that they're not able to pay their bills. And, and honestly, uh, this brings up, I don't know if I'm totally answering your, your question directly, but I tend to find small businesses not charging high enough prices. They tend not to be priced high enough. And... They think that they're not being fair, or um, if they have cut prices to try to get people in the door, they can't raise their prices back up very easily. It becomes kind of sticky, right? Because people start to think, oh, this is the, this is the price that I should be buying it at with the 20% off or whatever. I only go there when I get deals. And so people start to become stuck with that. Um, so one, one example, um, I have a, one of my economics majors, she just graduated, Cadence Haney. You know, you know Cadence? You know Cadence, right? Um, her family runs a popcorn stand, and they had it, I don't remember what this was. I think it was $3 and, no, it was $4 and $7 maybe for their uh, kettle corn was one of the products that they sell. And so... Um, she found, I, through asking her questions, a lot of people buy the um, smaller bag. And of course they make more money if they can get more popcorn and more revenue because the, the, co the marginal cost of filling a bigger bag compared to a smaller bag, the bags are about the same price. You know, the extra amount of filling a bigger bag is a lot cheaper, but it's three bucks more. So I suggested that they raise their price at least a buck to push, to nudge people into the bigger bag. And so they took about a year <laughs> and uh, 
they, because they're like, oh, people come to us because they know our prices. And I talked to Cadence's mom about it a little bit, or I think Cadence mostly relayed what I had said. And But eventually they did it. And so then they came back and gave me feedback that they thanked me for the advice because their sales didn't drop at all by raising their price. And what it did is it helped nudge people into the bigger bag. So if they keep their $7 bag $7 and they raise their lower price bag to 5 now you almost feel like a schmuck not buying the $7 bag, right? Because it's only 2 bucks more for the big bag. I'm going to get a lot more for just 2 bucks more. Marginal cost to the business is not much, right? But the margin is that much more. So we're getting an extra... Uh, two bucks if I go from the small bag at five to seven if I can get more people jumping into the big bag then I'm making two bucks more with very minimal additional cost to that bag very profitable and so that can help drive customers but if they're too distant from each other then you won't nudge people into that bigger one and that's why you see at the movie theaters uh, the quarter more right so Three two seventy five or three dollars for the extra large one. Well, it's like oh, they make it kind of a no brainer. Well, I'll spend the extra quarter for it. That's exactly what they're doing. They would normally price that smaller one with the smaller cup probably fifty cents to seventy five cents to a dollar cheaper than what they do. But they purposely brought the small one up just to make you feel good about buying the bigger one, right? Brianna, did you have a comment? You're going to say that, yeah. So that's a similar similar strategy. There was some interesting uh, economics research done on that with the pricing, where they they took a popcorn place and they did various prices to see what was optimal on different nights, and they kind of saw what how people behaved with different price spreads on the on the popcorn. Okay. Um, okay. So we clicked through. People don't like knowing their schmucks. So you got to keep your screen a secret. All right, so yeah, I think we're done with it. Maybe I'll breeze through this one. This is kind of easy. Oh, we got another chapter. We're, not done. we're almost done with this chapter. Uh, just a quick little example with conferences. So um, how they treated the conference people. Um, let me let you read it. So conferences kind of run into this. There's more cost, of course, with travel and whatnot. How do they prevent arbitrage? I would assume that there's a limit in because you've got people who are real close. How much does it cost them to go to the conference? I mean, it might be an hour or two drive. That's not a big deal. Somebody coming from old cheese, obviously, right. it's going to be a lot. But maybe they're, they're charging five hundred dollars for the conference, or right? Something. So they might be able to help out these people going old cheese, but they're not going to drop so far that the person who's local isn't willing to just go ahead. And I don't think that's really the issue they're worried about. What, what's the issue with arbitrage? It's kind of not maybe it's purest form that we were talking about before where they can buy and resell it, although maybe they could in a sense. But what do we not want to have happen? The locals buying it and then selling it on eBay or crazy. Yeah, if they can resell it, which might be a stretch, but what we for sure don't want have happening is the locals saying they're from out of state. So the locals could say, Hey, Uncle George, you live in Atlanta, right? Um, can I use your address for as the conference address for this conference that's coming up, right? And so now they get the $200 conference price instead of the $500 conference price. Uh, so that would be the kind of arbitrage or um, lying that, that you might that you might face, right? So you'd have to be careful on somehow proving people are where they are. Or it might take a little bit more work to uh, make sure we're not having that happen. But for the most part, that one could possibly be a go. All right, 
Heading into the home stretch. What we got here? 12 slides. We might even get done early tonight. All right, so Indu, you brought up the iPhone. This, I don't know if this is, I don't think this is exactly what you're talking about. You, you're talking about black kids and white kids. Wait, that's the answer. I'm so what was the question? Oh, well, that's what I said. Having the having the addresses double checked. Well, the conference attendees had to be verified with their addresses, which takes a little bit more work on the people who are running the conference. They can't just take in applications. They might have to hire an FBI agent or something to check out, make sure that they are where they are. Like, the shipping address. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, Apple. Did any of you buy this phone when they came out with the two versions in the discount? You did? <laughs> so they had two versions, the 8 gig, the 4 gig, and then two months later, So how long do you think Apple needed to wait before they tried something like that? That Just what's your gut feeling? I'm just kind of curious. So they did it two months later. That was the result. I think you have to. Next model, you think they would have had to wait all the way until next? And that's usually what goes on, right? Yeah. They kind of hold the, hold the prices constant. So that's the lesson that they learned. And think of the millions of dollars that it cost them on just that, that move alone. So everybody who bought it earlier, they totally unraveled the price. I mean, this didn't happen basically, right? Because they were hoping these are the high demand, high value customers that buy it early. They gotta have the iPhone on the first day, you know, they're willing to pay whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter what the price is type of thing. Well, they lost all of that premium was gone. And so uh, the price discrimination scheme unraveled for them. So got to be careful. Now back to my question. What do you think? You think all the way to the next model, which is about a year, I guess, <laughs> maybe longer, not much. But they seem like they're rolling out new models all the time. Um, September 12th. Do you think six months would have been enough or people still would have been ticked off or eight months or? I think you could have faced it more throughout the year. Yeah. Instead of just this sudden, I mean, we're talking about the, Eight gigabyte models price is lower than what the four gigabyte was to start with. Yeah, it's a hundred dollars less. Right. So I mean, that's a huge drop. Yeah, it was. They were trying to move a yeah. lot of excess and inventory, and then it screwed up their yeah, demand they estimation. Could, I think. You know, space that out a little bit more over the next four or five months. Yeah. Maybe even longer, and it would have been less of a uh, you know, shock to the head. Now, do you think they? Uh, what if they would have did something like selling them as refurbished, even if they weren't, if they were brand new? <laughs> think that would have worked? It would have been a different target market, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Some people knew it, it's a little bit different target market, but if it's Apple certified refurbished, right? Some companies do that, right? When there's returns, Apple certified refurbished, but it turns out they're just bluffing, and these are brand new ones. They just needed to get rid of this excess inventory, but they, they kind of re-characterized them as Apple certified refurbished, and maybe they would have needed to. But how do we refurbish them if we get in two months' time? I mean, yeah, I think, I, I think you're right. Two months is still too quick, probably. Yeah. And, yeah. Supply and demand chain, I mean, they go ahead and term it as SOH, stock on hold. So they depreciate the value of the product and then they say, okay. So do you think executives would be able to keep that under wraps in a big company like Apple if they chose to make that decision? And the public response was very strongly to dishonesty. <laughs> yeah, because we're shifting away from this, right? This one was at least honest. They just did it and they screwed up and had to pay. But if it came out that they were actually deceiving the public with the refurbished, 
that might have a whole set of different consequences. What if they like, then, then they're mobile. Like, or BW. Sorry, not mobile. Or do you ever like publicly announce a price reduction beforehand? That way people know it's gonna be reduced in a few months, but you're still gonna have people who want it right away. Yeah, I I oh I see what you mean. Before any of them are sold. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think that would work. And and I think that there would still be people who would pay the higher price because they want to have that in their hands now. They want to be that person that, oh, it's that new iPhone. Yes, that's the new iPhone. You should see how cool it is. So they're going to get that $200 worth of benefit. And if, if they're not price sensitive, they're going to do that anyway. So I think that would, if they were upfront about it, I, I think it would be hard to say that people would have hard feelings. Yeah, if they had a public announcement. So yeah, that'd be a good, good way to do that. But they, of course, were optimistic they would have probably never done that anyway because they were out, the, this was unexpected, you have to assume, right? They made a whole bunch of these and then they didn't sell as hot as they thought they were. So um, they were expecting the demand to be sufficient to, to dump them all at the higher price. Okay, good, anything else? Okay. Oh, how many people have an ink? Jet printer. I finally got rid of mine actually this last time and bought a brother laser printer and I've been so happy. Because what's the problem with inkjet printers? Yeah. One set of cartridges is half the price, if not the whole price, of what the printer costs in the first place, right? So that is a, a, a spot for bundling that was done very intentionally. We also talked about the razor blades earlier too. I gotta go buy some. I hate because I don't have a Dollar Shave Club, but luckily I don't have too big a scruff, so I can scrape the same razor for about six months. <laughs> so I heard with the Dollar Shave Club, you pretty much get a new razor blade. Is it every month or no, every week? Is it? Have you tried it? They're terrible. Are they? Because I think some of my brother, and maybe it depends on the brand, or maybe it depends on your face or something, but uh, he thought it worked pretty good. But. Try Harry's. Huh? Try Harry's. Harry's, is that what you use? So that's the Harry's. Yeah, I think that's what my brother used to. Which, which one did, did you do Harry's? I did the, the dollar one. And is that what it is, a dollar? Harry's is uh, oh, like German steel, but they cut out the middleman. So okay, that's what I've heard it, Harry's advertised. I think maybe that's what my brother did. So you did the Dollar Shave Club one. Okay. Well, all right. So you can see what they're doing here. By being able to pick off these goods, we can we can charge people. And it, it works beautifully because you got, oh, this printer's so cheap. Let's, uh, let's buy this printer. And... <clears throat> then you get to the ink cartridges. So you'll see this in some of the homework problems that you do as well as uh, the, the readings this week. So low value customers, high value customers. We're just kind of thinking about the demand curve. You know, who's along this side and who's along this side. So we got high value customers, low value customers. People who value it more than others, they're willing to pay more. So strategy number one, $50 printer, $50 cartridge. So low value customers, high value customers, $200 value, two cartridges, 150 total revenue, 250. Strategy number two, give away the printer, charge the cartridges. These people still buy the same thing. The low value customers still buy but we got the high value customers to spend more money because they were willing to spend, they had a $200 value placed on it. So high value customers for the bundle, right? Low value, high value. And 
by changing our pricing strategy, we were able to suck a little bit more money out of the high value customers. <clears throat> So it might depend on your particular good, the volume of use with, um, with what you're selling. I didn't know cost to use. So much. Yeah, I saw that little typo there. The costumers have a, have a heck of a time. Getting that. Might as well just make that edit right now. Oh. Yes, oh, yeah, that was switched around. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't know. Some of these, I edit some of these, so I'm going to blame that one on the author. Let's be fair. Why did you really make costumes? But I can't rule out that I edited that one. All right. <clears throat> This kind of reminds me of the Keurig machines too, like the one and done. How many of you do? You, does anybody here own the Keurig machine with the little one and done? Have you tried the the knockoff refillable ones that you can put your own cartridge in there? It's hit and miss. It's hit and miss. So yeah. All these ones work, but I got them from Price Chopper, and it was like, "This is a new Keurig cup." And I sat there between the two cups, and I was like, "What? <laughs> it's a difference." And like, yeah, yeah. So the refillable ones, and so uh, inkjet. Have you guys ever tried those refillable inkjets or the off-brand ones? There, there's ones that you could remember they had, they sold a little needle oh. with it and you could inject it into the refillable containers. So uh, the point is HP better be sure that they've got something proprietary enough that, that people will buy the ink cartridges because if there's an easy substitute available, as soon as you roll out and customers start to realize, well, geez, these are expenses, but expensive, but if they don't have any substitutes, then they're still going to buy the cartridges like I did for the last 10 years, but now I'm a happy brother. Put a little commercial out for brother copiers. I researched them. They're very reliable. Press the button. So, um, since I have one, one of the things that they've done to prevent those knockoffs is that there's software in the printer now that will recognize when it's an HP cartridge. Oh, yeah. It will recognize it when it's a different one. Mm -hmm. And what they do is every single time you try to print something without an HP cartridge, you get these pop-ups. Oh, the pop-up error. It's not an HP cartridge. Uh, so. I didn't know that. So they, I, I, had, I hadn't heard that they are actually reading them that way. So yeah. You might be endangering your machine there. It might not work properly, but if they can actually make it shut down, then, then they might have it. All right, so tying uh, is an illegal. We talked about a couple of illegal practices tonight. So remember, price discrimination is perfectly legal if protected classes, yeah, in general. So good. So that's to price discrimination is totally legal. I also talked about price fixing. Legal or illegal? Illegal. Illegal. And what did it mean? Uh, they decided on coffee shop. Yes, over coffee and donuts, they set the prices. So price fixing is illegal. And then this is another illegal thing called tying. And so if you tie the sale of a product to another, you could be running along the border of of an uh, illegal thing. And so it's kind of interesting with your uh, ink cartridge. Um, you know, it could be proprietary with the patents, but for them to force you into using their cartridge because they've developed technology that scans maybe a special barcode or something that can't be replicated 
Although it's hard to imagine they couldn't somehow re-replicate the, you know, whatever HP is doing, that there couldn't be a knockoff that would do it too. Um, but if they're somehow able to do that, they might be bordering on this tying uh, arrangement. And so when I was selling real estate, uh, it was illegal to say, if you list your house with me, I will uh, sell your other house at a discounted price, but they have to come together. I couldn't tie the two listings together with each other. That was illegal. And so they thought it was kind of anti-competitive for me to be bundling your time, forcing people contractually into two things. Now, in reality, I think it's kind of baloney from an economist standpoint and a market standpoint if you, if you can bundle the products together, but they, they felt like that was anti-competitive, and so there's laws against it. All right, that doesn't come up too often, though, with the, with the tying. All right, software, student version, business version. Give that a read. So can you think of any examples with software that you have that might be similar to this mini tab where the deluxe version does more things for you compared to the to the entry level, you know, the cheap one basically, the cheap version? MATLAB. MATLAB. What's that? MATLAB is the engineering software. It's okay. A lot of math, a lot of engineering, uh, aerospace engineering. Okay. Yeah, I can believe that. And for students. You're limited on on what functions you can do with it. Um, All right. Where you might be able to do seventy percent of what you could do with a business version of it. Right. There's still certain elements you can't. Have. But most of the functionality and everything looks the same. The interface is the same. What do you think the marginal cost is of them adding in those additional functionalities? Nothing at all. Nothing yeah. at all, probably. Because they are just model. locking up the future. So, in fact, in some cases, they've spent money to dumb it down. Yep. It's just the opposite. They start with the Cadillac, and then they unengineer some things, spending money, programming time, and otherwise, to strip it down from the from the Cadillac version. And so this is, this is a common way to, to get the high value, low value customers because the high value customers want all the bells and whistles and they don't want to have to think whether they have some, um, all the features or not. If they need them, they need them. If you're running a business and it's got a decent amount of dollars at stake, you just buy the, the top of the line version, the one that you need all the functionality. <laughs> So when you do that, some commercial users might choose to not take the fully enabled one. And so this gets into the, the strategy with the bottom table. We could choose to do just commercial only. You know, you have some companies that choose to do that. I just want to deal with business only. I'm going to specialize in catering to, to businesses and they don't have any sort of home version. Sell to all users at a low price, take the whole market, or price discriminate. Got the disabled version and the full feature version. And so each time you just kind of have to think and estimate uh, who's going to buy what and where. All of that depends on the elasticity of demand, right? So the business, the business versions have a steeper demand, their elasticity is a lot higher. So we want to be able to price it. The very first thing I gave you with the three uh, keys to successful price discrimination, number one is that your consumers have to have differing elasticities of demand. And so that becomes kind of easier to see when we start thinking about businesses using our product versus, versus households. Okay, questions or comments there? All right. Here's the 
printer, laser printer that I just bought. And they actually did this. Is that saying the same printer? They added the chip to it to make it print. So they actually made the cost to produce the lower priced printer higher than the other one. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> so kind of similar to disabling the software, they actually did that with the hardware and put something in it. So maybe the a savvy consumer might be able to take the old chip and modify it, do a modification or something, and make it the faster model. So, in other examples we talked about tonight, you got to think about competition and entry of new people coming into the into the market. So, uh, I tend to fly Southwest Airlines. That's who I just booked today, and they have been marvelous at beating up United and American and some of the the other bigger. Uh, airlines over the years and now they are considered a pretty big airline uh, with some of the, with them entering into new markets and cutting into the prices so this is this is kind of some interesting data that those business travelers used to be about three times higher and now it's about twice as high so that competition can um, enter in because if if you have that high class customer or the high value customer you might get a new person that comes in to compete just for the high class of customer, right? And so then that margin uh, goes down. So that threat of competition is, is a big one. All right, any other comments or questions on that? All right, finally some volume discounts. Single customer willing to pay seven for the first unit, six for the second, Five for the third, etc. A price of seven means the consumer will buy only one, but a price of six means the consumer will buy two. The price represents the value the consumer places on the individual demand curve. All right, so we kind of went through that with the individual demand. So now that's where our buy two, get one free, all of that kind of plays on the law of diminishing uh, marginal utility in this case with the consumers for prices on how much we can charge for additional units to try to get that extra unit sold. How could the volume discount come back to haunt you? I mean, we see it done a lot, but consumers or uh, businesses have to be careful about that too. Think about those three conditions for successful price discrimination. If you're doing volume discounts for the individual, hey, you buy five, you get the next two, at a cheaper at 50% off or whatever. Which one of those three conditions might come back to haunt you on that if you're not careful? Resell. The resale, yeah. So the same thing. Now that person who could say, well, geez, I've already bought five of them. The next two I don't really want, but I know there's lots of other people that want this particular good. And that's that's kind of the catch is like who how hard would it be to resell it? If there's willing buyers like right behind you in line, so you're, you're in line here and you bought five and it's like the next two are 50% off, how hard is it for you to go, Psst. you want me to buy the extra next two? And how many are you looking to buy, just two? Well, how about if I buy them and, and then you'll give me a little bit more money, we'll both make out like bandits on this, right? So if it's easy to resell, then that might not be a good idea. But 
So though, that's why those three conditions are important to focus on uh, because just because you can do it for one type of good doesn't mean you can do it for all types of goods. So we tend to find services with a lot of price discrimination. Haircuts, movie theaters, right? Things that can't be resold, you're enjoying them at the park, discount tickets to the park that day or something. So any sort of service tends to have more possibilities than, than uh, physical goods. All right, so here's how I might put it into play. Membership fee. Who uses membership fee type pricing? Costco. Sam's Club, Costco. Golf courses, right? So here at uh, uh, in Ottawa, I pay forty two and some change or 43 bucks for a family membership. Now, Dr. Tyner gets out made out like bandits because he's got six kids and I've only got one and it's just still the same price for the family. But how they kind of discriminate a little bit is most people get carts when they go golf. And so there ends up being a user fee. Me, I tend to walk because I'm cheap, number one. Number two, I like the exercise. So I get unlimited golf going up to great life with that with that process so in some cases you might be able to do this two-part pricing scheme where there's a fixed price and then you get some sort of discount on each um, each unit after all right so <clears throat> with the hypothetical example they had the total value that the consumer got if we take the whole area what they're doing here is down to two dollars they're taking the whole area underneath the demand curve. When you do that, you can try to grab all of their consumer surplus and then just charge them the price at the marginal cost is, is kind of the, the plan here. So if the marginal cost is here, at whatever price this is, if I can charge these people this area of the rectangle, $200 per month, let's say that turns out to be $200, and then the marginal cost of, of running the course or the, the whatever product I'm doing is just uh, $9, I'm going to charge a $200 membership fee per month plus $9 for each round of golf for 18 rounds or something. So I'm covering my marginal cost, all my variable costs, right? The cost of production, I'm just breaking even. But I'm sucking out all of their consumer surplus by having that membership fee. So that's, that's the concept with the two-part pricing. And that can be a little tricky with different people with different demands on what the proper proper price is. <clears throat> all right, I think we're almost done. Cable TV. So when I moved to Ottawa, I was having to get internet, you know, the normal choices you guys make with internet, cable, and phone. And so I started shopping around and see what deals are there. And so the promo that was up was you can buy any service you need, phone, cable, or internet. Each one you can get individually for 30 bucks. Okay. Or you can get all three for the today's low, low price of $55. So what is the extra cost associated with adding one of those services after I've already committed to one? If you're running by cable or whatever, and you've signed up for one service, what's the marginal cost of adding 
internet to it. Nothing. Nothing again, right? We're back to that kind of same story that as long as you've you know, paid the service fee or whatever to have the technician come out and run the cable to your house, hook up the modem, blah, 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 there's really zero cost of bringing that extra service into your house. Now, the other thing that's interesting is they don't know me. They don't know my preferences. So my willingness to pay at this point in time, I kind of put $15 for cable, which, which might be right. I mean, I was just kind of fudging things a little bit, but basically I was watching internet TV a lot. So I kind of was like, I don't really need cable. You know, I can live without cable. So would I buy cable all by itself? No, no. $15 worth of value, $30 worth of cost. Internet, I'd buy, right? I'm willing to pay $40 for internet because I'm mostly doing internet stuff and whatever. And then the local phone, you know, with cell phones and everything, that's almost worthless. Now, some other people who are big time cable people, but they don't really know how to type or don't even know the word internet, you know, some of those people that just like to, maybe they're a little older and they just kind of like their TV shows, but they don't really do much on the internet. The internet's kind of scary and foreign. Well, they might be willing to pay $50 for cable and next to nothing for internet. The cable company doesn't know who's who and what their preferences are, right? And so by having the bundle be 55, did they capture me for the bundle? I was willing to pay 40 plus 15, is 55 plus five for this is 60. I got $60 worth of value and bingo. All of a sudden I've got a local phone and I don't really care about local phone, but I bought it anyway because it has a little bit of value to me, just not a lot, right? And so also the people who value cable really high, uh, but not the internet, normally would have only bought the internet only if the pricing was offered separately. But by bundling them, they bought the bundle too. And so this is a very profitable thing to do, to bundle products together, because you're able to get more people buying your product than you otherwise would have. And that is people who um, might be all over the place on what they value. Does that make sense? All right, so that, that's getting into some pretty sophisticated uh, pricing and it, it's sometimes easier said than done uh, to pick the right bundle price and how, how you uh, get all that. Um, that takes some decent amount of uh, research and, and work. All right. Done. Look at your watches, people. It is official. That's a real deal. Real deal. All right. So now we're back to Wednesdays, just so you know. Um, and your homework for the material we talked about tonight is not technically due for Wednesday, the following Wednesday. So a week and two days. So we kind of. Uh, we kind of had a little, little catch up. So now you guys, now your, your last lecture stuff is still due Wednesday. So that is.